just getting the technical side of things here, talking about walking in freedom. And this is part three. Sue did her own special one. And so if we can get that recording in the notes, we're going to make that available to you on, on what she shared. But we're going to be talking about the pathway of love this morning, the pathway of love. And you can see the sheep there following these pathways up the hill there. And there were pathways that developed over time on the hills. And so the shepherds would lead them on these pathways and they would graze on their way up the hill and partake of the fresh pastures as they went up there. But really, we enjoy freedom as we walk on these ancient paths. And I don't know whether you can remember from a couple of weeks back our text scripture, the ancient paths, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. This is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. Wow, we've got to look with God's perspective. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is. It's obviously not obvious what the good way is. There's a lot of confusion in our culture today. And then walk in it once we find it. And you will, as a, a matter of certainty, find rest for your souls. I don't know, but there are times where, where the pressure in, in different ways becomes so much so that you don't feel at rest. You feel agitated. And yet God wants us in the midst of pressure, in the midst of our enemies, to enjoy his peace. In the midst of sitting in the middle row for five hours with your legs up around your ears like this, uh, yeah, you know, you can find rest for your soul. Anyway, having said that, these pathways that are, we're talking about here, the pathways of faith, of hope, and of love. These are tried and tested pathways. They, the, the God kind of faith, the God kind of hope, and the God kind of love has been tried and tested over all the years throughout human history. And they've worked in the past, they're going to work now, and they always work in the future, will work in the future. That's where God sees it. That's the way he communicates it to us through his word. And so if we receive that as so, then why would we want to focus on anything else, the latest fads, trends, uh, th what's ever trending on Twitter, what's ever coming down on Facebook feeds and everything like that on the mainstream um, news, everything. No, we need to focus on what will remain. And look at 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Three things will last forever. Say this with me. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Now, it doesn't mean that you can just throw out faith and you can throw out hope and then just concentrate on love. Like the culture um, that uh, sung a song, there was a group of people that used to have their hair like this in a pot. Can you remember them? They came from a city called Liverpool. Do you remember who they were? Do you want to hit? Do you want to pray that, Frank? All you need is... This is it. All you need is... Thank you, Frank. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was our era. You thought that's all you need is love. And the kind of love that they were talking about was one where you put little flowers on the end of the guns there. And then you went to Woodstock and you lay in the mud and you did what you did in the mud. And you regretted it because it was a muddy business. Anyway, smoking pot and everything else. Just love is not licentiousness. Love is totally focused on the will and purpose of God. And it takes faith to access that love. So even though love is the greatest, and some people say, well, all we need is love in the church. Well, you know, <clears throat> when, they, when they started in the book of Acts to distribute the food, which is what Rodney does in, 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 up in Tampa as well, they have food, the poor people come on the buses, they give them food and everything like that. They go home with packets of food. They do backpack stuff, you know, go back to school stuff. They help people all the time. But, you know, I don't even know what I was saying there. <clears throat> what was I saying? Yeah, I was just moving right along now. You know, all, you, all you need is love. You need the faith. You need the hope. You need the love working together, the God kind of it. And really, if you're going to enjoy the fruits of God's love for us and then our response to that love, you and I are going to have to follow that pattern that we talked about quite some time ago in the book of Ephesians, which is to sit 
in the position that God has placed us and then to walk it out, which is our theme right now, is walking in freedom, the freedom that God has already achieved for us. We have to sit in it. We have to be seated and settled in that place of revelation. And then we can translate that into a successful and abundant and a, and, and a victorious Christian life. And then we stand our ground when the enemy comes to attack. So just a couple of pictures here that might uh, uh, show us here. We've got a little kiddo there. He's learning how to sit. He's so happy of his place in Christ. You know, we're seated in heavenly places, right, in Christ. And he has drawn us into his family. We were born again into his family. He teaches us to sit. That's what babies do. They learn to sit. They get up off, off being horizontal. They learn to sit. Next thing is they turn over. They want to crawl. Moms, come on now. What the thing? And then you've got the moms and the dads kind of wanting, enticing them to, to walk out their um, Christian experience or, the, or their, their life experience. The next picture shows a full-grown adult running their particular race. I mean, you don't go from zero to hero in, in three weeks. It takes 20 years for you to get to that stage where you can run a race and you can pull some weight and you can, and you can achieve some results there. So it's the same in the Christian, in, in the Christian walk here. If you and I are going to walk in the kind of love that, that is available to us in Christ, it takes getting a revelation of who we are in Christ, being seated in, in that revelation, then starting to practice it and walk it out before we finally take our stand and, and, and bite off some, some big things that God has for us to, to do in, in his love walk. But, you know, um, I put it this way in our next slide here when we talk about the madman at Gadara. I want to use this as an example now where Jesus, who is love, goes out of his way to heal, I call him Mad Max, because he was, he was a nut job, this guy in Gadara. Now, Gadara, as you can see from the little map here, is a region on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The scale there is about 10 miles from that point to that point, maybe 15 miles from that point to that point. Jesus did much of his ministry on this side of the Sea of Galilee. But on one occasion, he told his disciples, let's go to the other side here. We have need to go to the other side of the lake, to this region of Gadara, the Gadarenes, where the Gadarenes, that they did a lot of gadding about those people. They kind of, anyway. Mark chapter 5, I, I've got a little a passage of it there on the screen. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat... Immediately they met him out of the tombs. So they had their tombs near the coastline there, away from the little towns and so on. A man with an unclean spirit, which is a reference to a demon spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. This is where he lived. He was not homeless exactly, but he wasn't living in town because he was such a nut job. He was crazy. They didn't have insane asylums and everything like that. So he would go out there. And picking up at that verse from my Bible here, he had been bound, uh, sorry, he had been dwelling among the tombs, for no one could bind him, not even with chains. So they tried to chain him with metal chains, and it just didn't, wouldn't work, because he'd often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him. There was the supernatural strength that the demons gave him to pull these things apart. They were broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. No one in town could, could bring him down from where he was. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. So you know the teenagers, you know the, today and, and, and in our society, there's a lot of cutting that goes on, which is a, a kind of I don't know want to psychoanalyze it too much, but um, you know it's a kind of an avoidance technique from the other pain and the inner pain that's going on, and so they take it out on themselves and feel the physical pain to try and get away from the from, the, from the, the internal pain. Now, in this case, this guy got so bad in this that he was cutting himself with stones. He was really out of it here. And when he saw, verse 6, this is interesting, from afar, coming out of the boat and coming up the hill there, he ran and worshipped him. Wow. There have been uh, other occasions in the Bible, we won't get into it right now, where demons, the, the dark side, can actually recognize the light. Now, do they bow down and confess the lordship of Jesus? No, they don't. But they recognize it. 
and they say something about it. It comes out. And so this is what he said. He cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? So, I mean, he had theology going through him here. I implore you by God that you do not torment me. I mean, this, I, I haven't really studied this out in huge detail. But here's this demon using this man's body to cry this whole thing out here. For he said to him, this is the reason why this guy was crying out like this. Jesus, when he walked up to him, he just said this. Come out of the man, unclean spirit. So he'd been on a mission. Love had gone out of its way to reach this crazy kook on the far side of the lake that was the reject of the whole town and the regions and everything like that has no bearing on what was going on on this side of the lake no one ever wanted to hang around with this crazy guy over there and yet Jesus love propelled him to go all this way to deliver him from this demon then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he also begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now, so Legion, in, in Roman terms, how many was that? Becky and Sue, Janine, anybody? Scholars here? Any scholars here? Legion was a thousand, wasn't it? I believe it was at least a thousand demons that this guy had. Now, the thing about um, spiritual beings is they, they can inhabit a, a physical being and not crowd each other out in in that sense a thousand of them a thousand of them can you imagine his mind buzzing and 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 cutting and running around and shouting and screaming and crazy i've seen a couple of guys down by the side of the road that are like that a guy came into the office one time in 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 um, San Bernardino in California and i was on duty i was the pastor that if anything happened in the foyer um I would be the one to help. The security guy was there. The, the ladies were behind a high counter, and so they were protected in that way, and they had a buzzer that if anything happened. Well, boy, some things happened. And a guy who was ministering to a, a crazy, drugged, crazed, demon-possessed guy pulled him in here, and the guy was buzzing, and, you know, just all over the place, um, just jerking and shaking. And I, I, don't, I don't think he was foaming at the mouth, but, you know, this guy was trying to get him delivered, and... And get him, you know, rehabilitate him, and he was just reaching out to this bad guy on the streets back in South Africa, and so we had to be involved in that too. Back in South Africa, there was a guy that used to have woolly hair; it was all dirty and matted and everything. He looked like he slept under a bush somewhere, and he would be jerking around and walking down the side of the road there. And um, so, you know, you do get some people. Those are the two examples of people that I've seen that are just totally, totally demon influenced possessed whatever and and they do some crazy stuff and yet jesus was able to cast out this these demons who then begged him earnestly verse 10 that he would not send them out of the country now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains and these people knew the jewish culture they weren't supposed to be raising swine swine were unkosher so you know, they were disobedient folk out that way so all the demons begged him saying send us to the swine that we may enter them and at once jesus gave them permission now jesus figured okay it's better that these demons go into the pigs and deal with the pig situation rather than let them float around the villages here and start to latch themselves onto other people there so the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine there were about two thousand there you go two thousand so there were at least two thousand demons got the number there and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed. So it was a quick thing. It wasn't a kind of a slow counseling, you know, with a counselor with a sign on the side of his house or his, in his office here in town. And you go back for 42 sessions, it cost about $10,000. And slowly then you feel a little bit better on medication and everything. No. Boom. When Jesus delivers someone, they get delivered. And so he was delivered straight away. And they came to him, saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it had happened who had been to, to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. 
Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. You would think, wow, the son of the most high God has come across all this way to deliver this man who's caused so much problem in our community. Jesus, won't you stay at least the night? We've got some lovely falafel here. We've got some lamb. You know, and olive oil and everything like that and set up a feast for him and welcome him to their presence and we've got these people who are sick and those people have got this issue please 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 because the news must have gone out a little bit about him there they asked him to leave how dumb can you get and still breathe when love comes to your door and you push him away what a sad situation here and so that's what basically what happened. They began to plead with him. And when he got into the boat, the guy who's demon possessed had the presence of mind to ask him, can't I follow you? And Jesus said, no, go home and be a testimony to your friends and let them know what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion on you. And funny enough, Gadara, if we have a look at Gadara once again at this map here, there's a bunch of cities and they're not shown on this map to the, to the uh, southeast called the Decapolis. Say Decapolis, Deca for ten, Polis for cities. There were uh, ten cities that are identified on other maps, the region of Decapolis. And when Jesus told his, the, the disciples and the people in Jerusalem that a time is coming when this temple will be ra raised to the ground, will be pulled down, he was prophesying that within a generation, the Romans would come into the land, devastate it, and what they were to do as a consequence when they see this happening is to turn and run to the mountains. And the mountainous region that a lot of them ran to was the Decapolis. And those that ran to the Decapolis were saved, the Christians. Because there were a lot of Christians now in Jerusalem from the time that Jesus was crucified and taught on this till the time that the Romans came 40 years later in AD 70, thereabouts. Those that stayed in Jerusalem and tried to fight off the Romans, they all got slaughtered. The whole city was razed. Everyone got slaughtered. The Romans just made a big tribulation in that whole story there. But those that obeyed Jesus and fled, they fled to the Decapolis. And the Decapolis was able to protect them and help them because a spiritual temperature had changed because of this man's witness, a lot of people argue. This man's witness had an impact on that whole region, that there were a lot of saints there that would pray and intercede and create an environment that when people fled from Jerusalem, which was down southwest here, on the southwest of the map there, when they fled across and into the Decapolis region there, they had a, somewhat of a safe haven from the Romans. The Romans didn't go that far in their slaughter. Just an interesting uh, aside there. But, you know, I'd like to tell you the story here with the next slide. You'll see um, a picture of a huge wave. This is actually a photograph of a huge wave on Lake Erie. Now, you know Lake Erie, there's like some mad humans eat onions. So it's Lake Michigan, mad, what's it? Ontario, and Huron, and Erie, and what's the other one? Frank, you should know. Superior. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, one of these lakes, this is the photograph of Lake Erie, that, that even though it's not a, an ocean or a sea, is able to generate these huge big waves. And this, the story goes of a father, um, and I'm not sure whether it was Lake Erie, but I just took the photograph of Lake Erie to illustrate that you can get a hugely stormy um, sea uh, or, or waves on, on, a, on a lake even. So he went out on the lake with his son and his unsaved friend that his son was witnessing to and the family was witnessing to. And they only had uh, one kind of like life um, ring, one of those things that you throw out if someone falls in the water and everything. And what happened in the storm, something like this, the father was left in the boat but the two kids fell out into the water. And they started to drown. They couldn't get back. The father couldn't maneuver the boat to save them and everything. It was just a total chaos and a total tragedy in the making. And so there was this one life vest, a life ring. Let's just call it a life ring. 
that was available. So who was the father to throw it to? Now he knew that his son was saved. And he also knew that the other guy was not saved. And that if he died there, he would go into a Christless eternity. So the father chose to throw the ring to the unsaved kid who got saved his son drowned literally got saved hauled into the boat saved and then um, was witness to and I think gave his heart to the Lord as a consequence of that the father giving his son for the salvation of the lost and this is the kind of love um, sacrificial love that gives itself for the benefit of others that the apostle John understood and he allowed this love to get close and so when we look at the, the Last Supper now, and this is not the famous Leonardo da Vinci uh, painting, but this p particular painting does show it a little bit better, but it shows the Apostle John leaning, nestling up to the chest, the breast of the Messiah. All the, uh, this is somewhat of an accurate thing in that the table was a low table. Mostly in those days they would sit on the floor and they'd have a low table, but you know, the Middle East, uh, the Middle Ages photograph, uh, paintings didn't have that. But, you know, uh, I'm not sure which one was Peter. Maybe this was Peter here. Peter's usually portrayed as a kind of a rugged guy with, with a beard and everything like that. But Peter was the one who lent over to John. So it's probably, it probably is that sequence is John the Apostle John the Apostle of love and Peter who was the action man he was the superhero action man kind of guy he led over to John and said you know ask Jesus who the heck it is that's going to betray him because Jesus had told his disciples he told you you're going to betray me and the thing about it is it's just as it's come to me Jesus describes Judas as my own familiar friend now a friend has different levels and meanings. A friend is someone who you know is, is kind and you get on with and you share the common things and everything. And then in covenant terms, a friend is someone who is who, who's committed to you in covenant for the purpose of establishing God's will. And so Jesus describes Judas as his own familiar friend. And then we have, have from another scripture over here that Jesus knew from the beginning of his choosing the disciples who would betray him. So yet he, he, yet he developed a relationship with Judas over the three years where he could genuinely and with purity, because to him who is pure, all things are pure, he could say, this is my beloved friend. Why do you betray me with a kiss, a covenantal kiss in the garden of Gethsemane when he betrayed him? And so the love that God has for people is such that even though he knows what you're going to do next week or where you're going to stumble or where you're going to fall or wh what issue you haven't dealt with yet or whatever it is, he still loves you this week knowing what's going to happen next week. And he still loves you because he knows what happened before that. So your track record is the same love yesterday, today, and forever. And so when John leans on his breast here, we see... This description in John chapter 13, verse 23. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. Now, funnily enough, when you read that expression, whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved, guess who wrote those words? John. He was writing about himself. What a cheek. <laughs> you might say what a cheek does he have to describe himself as the disciple that Jesus loved I'm he's basically saying I'm on his top top list top tier he loves me he loves me did you get that guys he loves me <laughs> and yet 
When we look at it through impure eyes, we don't understand that he had a revelation of Jesus' love for him that the others did not have. And so he wrote about it in his gospel, and he wrote about it in his letters, and he described himself as such. Now, did Jesus have favorites? He had a strategy. He had Peter, James, and John, which he took up the mountain. So it was his inner circle. And then he had this circle of the rest of the disciples. And then he had the 120. And then he had the 3,000. And so there, there, there was a strategy associated with it. And he would share certain things with certain people at certain times, not because he was showing, um, let's just say in our modern terms, unfair favoritism, but because he's got a plan. And so that frees you and I now. That when we come to the Lord in prayer and in worship and crying out to him for help in, in, in times of distress and with issues and everything. We can be like that little baby seated firmly on the revelation, the sure foundation of a solid ground, a little baby feeling secure, sitting there, we can be seated in the knowledge that God loves us. I am Janine Horak, the one that the Lord loves. I am Becky Espinosa, the one that the Lord loves. I am his beloved. And when we know that we are his beloved, it takes us to another level of relationship than if we just say, well, I'm a child of God. No, I'm a beloved child of God. Because that's what Jesus heard from the Father when he was baptized at the River Jordan. The heavens opened and a voice from heaven came down and said, this is my, everybody say it, beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Before Jesus had done anything. So faith, hope. And love starts to gain momentum there. And it gets to a point here where John writes these things about his relationship with the Lord. So I think if we move right along here, love allows Jesus to serve us. And we might look at Peter as um, a really go-getter, a do doer type of person, aggressive, get the job done kind of person. Yes, he did have a relationship with the Lord, a love relationship with the Lord, but not to the degree that John did. And if love is the greatest thing, a lot of people, you know, we want to see power and we want to see, we want to see demons cast out and all that. And, and, and we do want to see all of that stuff. We want to see people set free. But why? Why? Is it because we just like the sparks to fly like a big, strong football game or a MMI fighter, cage fighting, you know, session? No, it's because of love and mercy. And that's kind of what, what I saw, you know, at the conference there with, with the pastor there. He told the story, and I've heard it before, and I know the story and, and the ins, a little bit of the ins and outs of it. But on Christmas morning, Christmas morning, how many years ago? So 10 years ago? Yeah, 10, 15 years ago. His daughter finally succumbed to cystic fibrosis had several terrible moments over the years terrible terrible you know, 18 years she lived for 18 years and he died in her his arms she died in his arms on Christmas morning and um, he made a vow he said you know devil you're going to pay for this and so he said I'm going to trust God for for millions of souls and so far through his influence through the crusades through churches that he's impact through the the mega crusades um, online everywhere where someone gets saved and recorded as saved verified salvation um, there's about 20 million people since that time there's been people before that but 20 million people since then. So that family, you know, has not, um, you know, just coasted along on flowery beds of ease. He lost his brother, his eldest brother, um, in about 19, what, 75, 80, you know, let's just say 78 or so, whatever. He lost his brother, you know, in the family. He's got um, two other brothers and himself 
and that one of them is definitely in the ministry here in the States and so on. So the love that he displays, the mercy and the compassion and the generosity in paying for all of the lunches and the hotels and everything for all the incoming ministers, just everything. He believes God for millions upon millions. So, you know, you, you could argue, oh, he's one of these prosperity uh, gospel uh, preachers. But when, when a scripture that really helps me is that to the pure, all things are pure. And so uh, financial resources, people, giftings and callings and, and things that you do in church and, and uh, on evangelism crusades and you reach out and you touch and you pray for people over the hours and spend hours upon hours with people. When it's motivated by love and mercy, all of those things just become means to the end. You know, a lot of people place too much attention on, on stuff and, and how much value Christians should put on stuff. And, and there's just a huge big fight over that whole nonsense. And it, it's a lot of nonsense. If someone's got a problem with, with stuff, they've got a problem with stuff. Not the stuff itself that gets used for the purpose of reaching out to the gospel. Anyway, enough of that. So we could ask ourselves a question, are you a Peter or a John? And as Jesus washed their feet at that last supper, he, he took that cloth and he washed their feet. Peter was the one who resisted Jesus. Whereas John is the one, lay it on me, boy. Just just wash my feet. I'm your beloved. I need it, you know. And washing of feet refers to the walk, our Christian walk. Because as we go through the week and things happen and we pick up dust of this earth. And we don't need to get born again again every Sunday. We just need to be washed by the word. Washed by the word. You're sitting here this morning. You say, well, well what, what's really happening here? Well, you're getting a shower in the word of God, hopefully. By the Spirit of God, certain things are being uh, deposited in your life, uh, rearranged, uh, focused, whatever it is that He wants you to hear. We get washed in our walk by the Word of God. So as we prepare for communion this morning, just one final point here. The Apostle John wrote this about love. And there's so much more that we could say about love, but this is what we're going to do this morning. Years later, about... A.D. 90 is supposedly when he was writing these letters. So that was now um, 60 years later. He'd experienced the love of God, and this is what he wrote. And we have the benefit of it in 1 John 4.10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, to deal with that gap between God and holy God and sinful man it's not our love for God and so I'm not going to tell you this morning as as some preachers that I've heard and um, they they're basically the bottom line is you better get your act together you better shape up and you better start loving God and obeying him because if you don't and then whatever their particular doctrinal slant is I'll give you the answer this and that and so on. And so the whole emphasis is on us reaching up to God and telling Him, we love you, Lord. We worship you. We praise you. We pay our tithes. We go on the streets witnessing. We're good people. And, and, and man, man, it's a lot of hard work, Lord. I'm sorry, but it's a lot of hard work. No, the whole emphasis of love is getting a revelation and receiving His love for us. And when we receive that capacity on the inside of us to love, it becomes a breeze to go out and love people that don't, are not lovely. To go out on the streets and rub shoulders with people. The road rage on, on the road today is crazy. People are crazy in the shops. People are crazy in the schools. They're crazy in politics, everything. It's absolutely insane out there. How do we love those people if we don't have the capacity ourselves, the faith to receive it, the hope to know that it's going to work out, and then the actual uh, juice, the, the strength, the power of love itself that never fails. That's what must flow out of us to unlovely people who do us bad and do us and say things about us, nasty things about us. So why don't we partake of communion this morning in that light and sing along with the song, and then we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus.